In our series of messages on the fruit of the Spirit, we have looked at six out of the nine. We've looked at love, joy, peace. We've looked at patience, kindness, goodness. Now, there's only one way to memorize those. Okay? Y'all help me out. We have looked at love, joy, peace. Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. We've looked at love, joy, peace. And then we looked at patience, kindness, goodness. That's six out of the nine, okay? And so we've got only got three more to go. All we need in all of those, we need as an evidence in our life to live our lives. You can't leave out three out of the six, out of the nine. You can't pick and choose which one you want and somehow leave the other eight. Let me give you another example that I found, and I did not know that this was true, but I thought, well, you know what? I'll just find out if there is one. I asked the question, and I went to Google, okay? (laughs) Anything you want to know, just go to Google, right? And I asked the question, is there a nine-cylinder engine? And for example, there is. There is a straight nine, Nine-cylinder diesel engine, and it's used in ship uh, propulsion. In fact, it's a Rolls-Royce engine. Now, if you're going to want an engine, understand something. You want a really, you want a Rolls-Royce engine. I tell you what, it's so smooth. In fact, 1973, my wife and I left from Israel to go to London for a little bit, get away from the, the war area, and then we came back to Israel. And so I'd forgotten that they drive on the wrong side of the road. Now, if you're from England, I'm sorry, but you're on, you do drive on the wrong side of the road. Well, I decided to step off the curb. I stepped off the curb, and about that time, this car that I did not hear came whizzing past me. Guess what? It was a Rolls Royce. I didn't hear it coming. I didn't hear it say it here, and I didn't see it leave me either. (laughs) That engine was a perfect timed, perfect engine. And that's what God wants now, and I take that as what God wants in our engine is nine cylinders, nine fruit of the Spirit working so well together that it just absolutely does not have a problem one in your life. Now, if you watch drag racing which sometimes I do at night, on Sunday night at 10, 11 o'clock, or whenever it is. And it's a rerun, by the way. Uh, funny cars and all that sort of stuff. Once in a while, an engine will blo- a, uh, a cylinder will blow. You know what happens when a c- cylinder blows? Number one, he doesn't win, win, the, win the race. <laughs> Number two, he'll be happy if he gets out alive sometimes. It will pop, and sometimes it just blows and fire comes out of it. Other times, it blows up the whole engine. You're not going to win when you have one cylinder blown. Now, listen to me very carefully. If one of those cylinders, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, will get to faithfulness and meekness and self-control, if any of those cylinders blows its, its cap, guess what? You're not going to make it. You are going to have a rough time in your life, all because we have somehow have not determined that we would live by the fruit of the Spirit. It is you and I need to be able to control and to be able to live by every one of those and not have a blowout when it comes down to it. Christ is not honored. We lose our witness. And so today's cylinder, let's call it, is faithfulness. It's found in Colossians, the the second chapter, verses 6 through 7. We'll turn to that scripture in just a moment. And it's found on page 793 or page 622. This word faithfulness appears... 234 times in the New Testament. I know I counted every one of them. 
Now that means then if I were to be able to, to somehow talk about all 234, that means I would have to talk about at least eight of them per minute on a 29-minute message. Don't worry. It's a huge subject, but I think we can cover most, not all of it, but definitely not all of it, but parts of it. But it's a huge subject. It's an important subject. But I want to remind you, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11th chapter, verse 6. It is impossible to please God without faithfulness. You can try all the other things. You can try your, your love and joy and peace. You can try all the, have a, make sure there's a patience or self-control or whatever. But if you don't have faith in God and willing to step out on faith in God, you will not please God at all. I want to remind you of that. Because without faith, we also cannot really live the fruit of the Spirit. So let's read verses 6 and 7. Colossians, the second chapter. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as have been taught, as you have been taught, abounding with thanksgiving. Paul writes to the church at Colossae. He tells them certain things about their, their life in, with Christ Jesus. You have received Christ. You have trusted in Christ Jesus as your Savior. Your Spirit of God has engulfed you and dwelled within you. You are a child of God. You have eternal life. You have Jesus within you. And yes, all of those things are true. And he says because of that, because you've done that, walk in him. Live, act, be a Christian do not be the, the world in sheep's clothing. Walk as a way of life. In other words, everything that you get up in the morning, if you walk over to, the, to, the, uh, to shave, well, then be a Christian when you shave. You know, when you go down to work, be a Christian when you, walk to, when you go to work. Be a Christian when you drive to work. Be a Christian when you, you get off work. Be a Christian with your wife when you, you decide to take her out to eat this afternoon. I'm trying to help you out, wives. Okay. Walk in him. And then he says there's a reasons why you should walk in him. He says you're rooted in him. You're rooted in him. Now listen to me. This is one of those perfect tenses. One of those that I love to look at. It is a perfect tense. It means that when you were saved, you got rooted in Christ Jesus. And you got so rooted in Christ Jesus that that set up a state of being that you're now rooted. That means that in the present tense, you are still rooted. And that means that when you get into heaven and when you go before Christ and in all the life that you'll live up until that time, you will always be rooted in Christ Jesus. He says, walk in him because, first of all, you're rooted in Christ Jesus. And when you're rooted in Christ Jesus, he says you're going to be built up. Now that word is present tense. That means that on a daily basis, you got to work at being built up. You're just not going to automatically be built up all in one day. Now, back in Labor Day, we were coming back from, from the coast and came through, uh, I think it was Quero. It could have been Refurio. Some of you may know. There's a convenience store, and behind there, there's two huge trees. Uh, they're probably at least 200 years old, if not larger. Oak trees. And I took, to, I took a picture of both of them. Huge. I mean, I, this would not even get around a portion of it. Okay? Huge trees. Sometimes when you're through there, we'll stop and look at them. They didn't get that away overnight. They did not get built up like that overnight. It took time. And it takes time for you, for you to be built up in the Lord. But you have somebody helping you. You have the Lord Jesus, not only that, but you're also to be established in the faith. Again, this is a present tense. It says that you need to be established. You need to be able to, to, to show that you're mature, that you're maturing in Christ. It is on a daily basis that you do these things of how to do it. Now, I know that some of here, every day I come to work and I look across the street, and the Methodists are building a building, by the way. I don't know if you know that or not. They're, it's about right over here. You know that building didn't get there all in one day? Did you know that? I've watched it. 
they had to prepare the ground. Then they had to put some forms on it, had to put some steel with it, had to put some concrete with it. You know, they had to do a, a then they had to do some walls and then they had to do a, a roof and then they had to do some sides and they had to do all the other things along with it. And now what you see now is work, work that they've done. Look at your life, establishing Christ Jesus, maturing Christ Jesus. It's taken time to get you where you are. And some of you ain't got there yet. I'm, so, I'm sorry I used the word ain't. Some of you are still trying to get there. But he then says for us to abound in thanksgiving. And I love that first song we sang. It talks about thanksgiving. Uh, I believe it's the first or second one, whichever, whichever one it was. And I was thinking about this word. It is a present tense. That means every day we ought to abound in thanksgiving before God. Lord God, thank you for this, 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 and this. You say, you don't know my life, Dr. Edge. I said, there's always something that we can say thankful for, we can be thankful for. It does not make any difference what it is. Each day we are to put into practice faithfulness. I will not go through all extensive, but there's three areas that I think that we can at least show faithfulness in those things. And not only that, but also live Colossians, the second chapter, verses 6 through 7, and show that faithfulness before God. First of all, faithfulness means always trusting in God. It means always trusting in God. Look back at uh, Psalm 91, Psalm chapter 91. That's on page 405 or 316. Or if you just kind of open up your Bible in the middle, it'll be Psalms. And so go over to number 91. I want to read two verses there. Two verses and two verses that you've heard over and over and over. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge. He is my fortress. He is my God. And in him, I will trust. David, uh, the psalmist, tells us. He says he tells us that there are certain things that he's going to trust in the Lord. He knows that God is his refuge. He knows that he is his fortress. He knows he's the secret place where I can run to. And yes, the most high God and the almighty God. And then he says, by faith, he says the following. In him, in him alone, I will trust in him. And it shows you and I that our faithfulness has to first of all mean that we will trust in God regardless of what happens to us in this life. That's trusting in God even though we don't see him. We don't, cannot maybe explain him. We may not know him as well as what we want to. We know that he is also a relationship builder. He never fails us. All of those things, we trust in him regardless. Faithfulness means, absolutely means, we do not question God's character. We do not question God's power in our life. We do not question God's moving of his spirit on our lives, nor his reason for putting us in the middle of whatever it is. You know, there's a sign out that always says, don't mess with Texas. Well, guess what? Sometimes God puts you right in the mess to teach you. Do you know that? There's some reason why he's there. And most people will holler and scream at God because of it. There's a reason. We trust in the Lord regardless of what that is. That trusting in God means all we trust in his word. Paul knew God's word. He knew it by heart. He memorized it. He would even pray the Psalms as a prayer before God. But only when the Spirit of God, now listen, only when the Spirit of God, of the living God, takes up residence, takes up dwelling in our hearts and lives, then that grabs us, that gets a hold of us. And it gets us so excited about God that we want to know more and more about what God is doing. And it should cause us to thirst more and to hunger more, to read more, to know more about God and want to know more about God. Why? Because in trusting God, it means we trust his word to help us get through those times. But it also means we'll trust in God's godness. Would you, 
Well, Dr. Edge, what do you mean by God of Godness? Well, I mean trust in his God, that he's God. What he does is God. God is a holy God. Trust that he's holy in all things. That he is a God of justice, God of equality, God a creator, a relation builder between you and him. He is a God of love. And yet, while we were yet sinners, he demonstrated that love by sending his son to the cross. He is a covenant keeper. He's the one that keeps his promises. He's our heavenly father that we can call on. All of those things, and that just barely touches the subject of God's godness that you and I are to trust in. Now, I know there's a lot of people and a lot of people that will want to destroy that trust. You go off the university, uh, youth, and, and there's always going to be a professor that wants to destroy your faith. You go into some universities and there's always somebody wanting to do something like what this one said. One of my calling in life is to shatter the faith of a naive fundamentalist as they come to my class. Just give me a room of young, naive evangelicals and let me at them, he would say. You can just watch them drop like flies hit by the raid when I challenge their faith in a deliberate, consistent manner. There are professors, and it's getting worse, and it's going to get worse, to try to completely destroy a Christian's faith, his trust in God. And there is nothing else that we can do except to hang on to the trust that we have in the word and what God has done in his godliness, that he's God. That's the only way to get through that. And then realize, unfortunately, that the professor really just does not know what he's talking about. Now, I realize that they're going to tell you they know all the answers. Professors know all the answers. You know that? <laughs> and not, you know, they, they, don't, they, just, they just make it look like they do. You know, they want, they want to make it look like they do. And they come across this way as it, because they don't know God. You're one up on them. And so if you have grandchildren and you have children in college and they come home asking questions, well, this professor said this, and this professor said this, what do you think about this? Then help your children, help your grandchildren get through that. Trust in God's godness. Second of all, I want you to notice something else. Faithfulness in God means we always, not only trust in God, but we also always believe in Christ Jesus. Look over at uh, Hebrews, the 11th chapter. We're not reading all of it. We're only going to read a little bit of the very tail end of it. Verse 35 on. That's that faith chapter. That's the one that lists of all these people that live by faith. And it gives us encouragement in doing so. But we're to believe, and all of them, from the Old Testament, of course, they were looking for Christ. And then he talks about some that were actually taught, believed in Christ after his resurrection. And he begins in that verse 35. Women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. They might obtain a better resurrection. There were some that were died to martyrs, get, martyrs' life. Still others have trial of mockers and scour, scourgings. Yes, and chains and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Were tempted. Were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world would not, was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and, and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith. Look at the list of things that he suggests, that he tells the writer of the Hebrews say that this happened. And by the way, some of that same thing is happening in our day and age. In some countries, these things happen as well. People are thrown in prison, sawn in two, 
killed, tempted. Uh, they live destitute lives because they, they can't get a job. Many of the things that they've listed, it happens in our day and age. And they have a, obtained a good testimony. Why? Because of their faith in Christ Jesus. They believed in Christ Jesus. That's where their faith is in. The writer of Hebrews then continues where he says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us why looking to Jesus the author and finisher of what's the word our faith the author and finisher of our faith Christ Jesus and he says there's certain things that you need to look to you need to look to him lay aside the the, the weight things that will ensnare you that not let you live by faith Run with patience, endurance, that which God has laid out before you. You have a race, I have a race. Every one of us has a race before God to live according to how he wants us to. And by faith, that's the only way to run that race. And then to look to the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is the one that has set that race. He's the author of that faith. He's the finisher, will bring you to the finish of that faith. The fruit of the Spirit, faithfulness, means we always trust, we always believe in Christ Jesus our Lord. You say, well, that's a e the easy part about it, that is we were saved. I was saved. I trusted the Lord. Yeah. The hard part is what? Putting it into action. See, that's the third part. Faithfulness also means faith in action. And that's found in Galatians, the second chapter. And I know you've already, if you were in Sunday school a couple of weeks ago, you may have even uh, read this verse. Galatians Chapter 2, verse 20. It reads the following. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's no other way to live your life except by faith. That's the only way to live by faith. I will tell you, a lot of folks will talk about faith. They'll describe faith. They'll even define faith for you. They'll even somehow um, tell you how to live by faith. It's kind of like that story and what happened in 1958. America's first commercial jet air service began in 1958, a Boeing 707. A month after the first flight, a traveler on a, a piston engine, propelled engine, a DC-9, excuse me, DC-6, sorry, sorry, air, aircraft people. Uh, one of the passengers was sitting next to an individual and they got to talking. That one of the passengers happened to have been a Boeing engineer for the 707. So they got to talking. And he started at length telling all about that engine. I mean that engine and what it could do and how it could do and how it could, could perform. And he gave a list of all the ones that were not and all the things that happened. The traveler then looked at him and asked him the question. If he himself had flown in the 707, the engineer said, I think I'll wait until it's been in service a while. It's kind of like, I've been saved 25 years. I've been saved 25 years, but I think I'll wait a while before what? I live by faith. Before I step out and do anything by faith. I think I'll, you know, I, I think I'll test the water first. That's what we end up doing. That somehow we're saved, we know we're going to heaven, we know goodness gracious, but we don't do what God really wants of us to step out by faith and take a, take a little, little step once in a while. And so I want to give you two or three steps you might try. Okay? Three things that my, you might could do. First of all, faith to witness. Now, I'm not talking about standing on the street corner 
And I've seen people do this. I'm not talking about going up to knock on doors every, you know, Tuesday night. I'm not talking about that either, house to house. I'm not even talking about going next door, even though some of you might want to. But as you're going through life, as you're doing whatever you do, maybe you can talk to some folks about church. Maybe you can talk to them about Christ or where they go or, or, or something about God to get them interested in thinking about it. That the Spirit of God will direct you to bring that conversation to about Christ. To bring it to somehow talking to them about Christ and a walk of faith. It might be that you're in a doctor's office. You talk to him about faith. Some doctors don't know God. They think they're, they're gods at times. Nurses, people in line, people, uh, uh, family members, strangers, and others. I'm standing in line at the Social Security office. There's always a line at the Social Security office. I don't know if you've been over there, but uh, you stand in line, you wait to go in, and you get there early enough, you stand outside. One morning, a lady in front of me, we got to talking. Turned out she was from Bastrop. I said, well, where do you go to church? Well, we're thinking about, we're looking for a church, okay? I have a daughter or a child and needs to be in, be in uh, youth or children or whatever it is. Well, I said, well, you ought to come to First Baptist. We ended up, ended the conversation. One day I went over to Faith Baptist Church to see how things were going. There was a lady over there that was helping pick up the trash. Guess who that lady was? It's the lady that I talked to in line at the Social Security office. And she found a place where she could serve or to help or do something along the way. And she had come over to Faith Baptist Church seeing that they were working on their, and she, she helped them do some of the work around that church. I don't know if she still goes there. I hope she does. I trust that she still goes to that church or she's come to that church. But I will tell you, God will put you someplace along the way to encourage someone to go to church or to be a part of what God wants in their life. Second of all, I want you to notice something else. I want to encourage you. Faith will also cause you to pray. Out in the hall, some of you have already seen this, is a sign-up sheet. Sign up here on the left-hand side out here. It says a call to prayer. Asking you to pick 30 minutes a day and pray. Now it may be, I'd love to have 24-7 all, all through the day this church is praying at some time or another. But I realize also that some people just will not, cannot get up between, I don't know, 12 o'clock at night and 6 o'clock in the morning to pray. And I, and I understand that. So please, pick a time that you are, is good for you. And I don't care if there's 20 people on the same time. Just sign up for that time to pray. You say, well, what happens if I, if I miss the time? Well, then just catch up, you know? When you can, just pray 30 minutes. You know, and say, Lord, I'm praying for that 2.30 in the morning, okay? You know, if you miss the 2.30 call. To pray, you say, well, what do you want me to pray for? There's two or three things I want you to pray for. And I think God would want us to pray for. Number one, what God wants, we want. Whatever God wants for his church, that's what we want. That means that God will unite us in all that whatever happens in what we do. Number two, need to pray for children and youth and adult ministries in this church. And the opportunities that we have been given by sitting in Bastrop, Texas, to do so. I'm going to ask you to pray that come the business meeting in October, we will vote on whether or not to take 9.5 acres of the 40-some acres that we have and to sell or to list it for sale. We're going to try this again. Use it for development, use it for a youth ministry, children's ministry, children's safety, and also the uh, what's going on even more out there. Ask you to pray about that. Whatever that vote is, 
That's what we want. We want God. I want you to pray reaching the hundreds of people that are moving into this area on a monthly basis. Pray that we have a faith to trust in the Lord. Because it's going to take that. It's going to take just an act of faith on our part. And then I'll, lastly, I want you to notice something else. Faith in action also means faith to live. And I want you to pray the Lord God help me to live the fruit of the Spirit. Let me, help me to live all nine of the cylinders that's going to be pumping. The next, and the, the ones that are coming up. It means we pray something like this. Believing God, we will pray. We will act. We will live by faith. Why? Because we believe God in doing so. And let Him determine it. I do believe that on our hands and knees before God, God has every opportunity to show us, to guide us, to teach us exactly what He wants us to do. And I ask you by faith to take 30 minutes a day and pray. You say, I don't know if I can make it through 30 minutes. Okay, well, you know, just think, take your, I don't know, take your, uh, your catalog of everybody that's in this church and pray for each one. That'll take you at least 30 minutes. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come to you. And we realize, Heavenly Father, that part of that fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. Faith, faithful to you. Faithful to our Lord Jesus and the, that he, the Spirit that abides within us. The life that we're to live. Faithful to know that, Lord, you answer prayer. That, Heavenly Father, that we not put our, our determination on it. But, Heavenly Father, we allow you to determine it what you want from us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that Lord God, that you would show us that you are truly God, that you're the God of this church. You're the God of our lives. Absolutely, Lord God, that you, uh, you amaze us in everything that we do because you're God. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that over the coming months ahead, that Lord God, that your spirit will guide us and teach us exactly what you want us to know. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you show us that today. You begin to show it over the next week and two weeks and, and a continued showing of what you want us to do. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that wherever we touch individuals' lives, no matter where they are, outside this church, wherever we are, that, Lord God, that you give us opportunities to tell someone about you. And that by faith we walk through that door that says we're going to tell someone about you. Use us for your glory in all that you would have us to do. And Lord God, we'll praise you and we'll thank you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth we pray. Amen and amen. Maybe there's a public...